Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Audio Advice Monthly Giveaway. I am so excited to have two of my great friends here. I've got Teo Nikolakis from Audioholics, who I've known for quite a while, and he and I have got uh, had lots of great discussions about audio, et cetera, and Jeff Earl, who worked with me a lot. He's from the NAD team, uh, brand manager, who I went back and forth with a whole bunch on the M66 when it was in beta. Uh, Teo and Jeff, welcome aboard, guys. Great to be here. Yes, yeah. thanks, thanks for having uh, us. Why don't, why don't you give us just a little bit of little bit of background on, on the in the M sixty six? Have you got it yourself, kind of thing? So uh, my name is Tam Nikolakis. I've been writing for Audioholics for I've lost track of how many years, well over a decade with audio reviews, and I'm lucky enough that I have the M sixty six in here for review, and I have two of the M twenty threes configured in bridged mono, driving a pair of a Rebel Ultima two salons and quad per listen D two twelve S subs as part of this review setup. So it's amazing. How about you, Jeff? Very cool. Uh, yeah, I'm Jeff Earl from Lembrook Americas. I'm the NAD and Blue Sound brand manager. I've been with the brands for 23 years now. So I had a lot of experience with the NAD brands and the birth of Blue Sound, of course. And I'm calling in from Montreal at the Hi-Fi show. And I've got a very similar system set up right behind me, an M66 with two M23s in bridge, two PSB T800s and four BP8 subs in a gigantic room here. So it's a very cool system that if you're in the area, you got to come here it. All right, so we are going to have a blast today. We're going to do a couple of things, but first I want to let everyone know we have a best question giveaway we're going to do, which is the Blue Sound Node. Jeff, give us just a little bit on the Blue Sound Node so we'll be getting fired up about throwing us some questions as we go forward. Yeah, this is our number one Blue Sound product. It is a streamer, multi-room, high-res streamer. It's the piece to have as an introductory piece into the streaming world. So if you're looking for a hi-fi piece to get into your system, and introduce streaming, this is the one to have. So we're pretty excited to be giving this away today. All right, so keep hitting us with questions. What we're gonna do is a little bit different than what we've done in some of these before. Um, I'm actually taking screenshots from the much more in-depth review that I did on the M66. So this is, you'll see these are a handful of screenshots from the YouTube video. And what we're gonna do is sort of walk you through over this next sort of 50, 55 minutes, a whole bunch about the product. As you hit us with questions, we'll sort of integrate them in or save them for the end. But let's just start with how beautiful this thing is. You know, a lot of uh, electronics products, you get them and they just like a you know piece of plastic or whatever. The brushed aluminum on this in the front uh, face and touchscreen, the volume knob, everything just looks gorgeous and totally matches the M23. So again, as Teo mentioned, he's got a setup with the M23s. Jeff's got one sitting there now, but you can see it, it just looks flat out gorgeous. So I thought it would make sense for us to start at the back of the unit. Um, you know, maybe let's first sort of dive in on the side of, you know, maybe Teo, you can give us a sense of, you know, you were putting it in your system and playing with it this week. On the input side, this does pretty well, doesn't it? This has everything you need. This starts to bridge into uh, AVR territory with all the connectivity. So you have your digital SPDIF, you have your analog, you have your, your digital XLR, right? Your XLR, uh, and then you also have eARC. So I connected this to a Sony OLED. Voila, I've got super high res uh, music and movies and everything coming right into this device for all my entertainment. Uh, so w while we're looking at the back, one of the questions that came in, Jeff, is uh, does this have home theater bypass? Yeah, it doesn't at this point in the software. So we were pushing this product out into the market, knowing that that feature was going to come later. So we're still working on that. That's going to come with a software update that will push right through to our customers. So stay tuned on that. But it is a priority for us to be working on that feature. Yeah, you can already see in the software that it's set up to have it. So it's literally, you know a uh, short period that will be integrated in. So Jeff, I thought this is one of the cool things about NAD that differentiates it from frankly, almost every manufacturer out there. And so I've sort of highlighted here as I did in the video, these MDC2 slots, what are these? Yeah, so for this product, um, they are future proofing really. But the MDC and, and in particular MDC2, which is our second generation for our two channel product is modular design construction, meaning 
we can put technology updates into this chassis in the form of upgraded cards. So you can put feature-based cards into this, much like a computer would with a motherboard, daughterboard type scenario. And we've done in the past HDMI boards, USB boards, all kinds of different scenarios. And the latest MBC2 board is a Blue Oz streaming board, but the M66 has that on board internally already. So as it sits, the M66 is ready for future upgrades, whether we add a HDMI card in the future or a USB card in the future, that um, those slots there will, will host that technology down the line. So I think this is one of the coolest things you all do because people make a big investment in terms of this equipment. And obviously your greatest worry is, oh, do I buy it? And like tomorrow it's, it's dated. And I, with the M66, as you'll see, as we go through a few of these slides, it, this thing is as cutting edge as it can get. But the fact that you've now got two additional slots as well is really incredible. Um, so, so I'll just pause here because I think this is the coolest thing. We actually had a question about this come in just a second ago as well. So when you think about home theater, people think about multi-sub, but very seldom when people are thinking about two-channel, do they think about multi-sub? But you can see here, it's got four independent sub outputs, which is incredible. Now, Teo, you actually have your system. Let's go back to your system for a second. Yeah. You have four subs running in it, correct? Correct. So I have four Prolisten D212Ss, and in anticipation of the question, all independently calibrated through Dirac. So you have total control over each and every sub. So yeah, it's not a, it's not a, um, a, a summed here. It, it's all independently calibrated. In, in my own system, when I played with this, I, you know, I show in the video where I put in some carbon special subs with some Martin Logan speakers. What it did in terms of phase aligning everything, you just go, oh my gosh. Because in a two-channel system, the people haven't been able to do that. It's, it's pretty incredible. I think that, Scott, to that point, I think that's one of the real differentiators with uh, the NAD brand in terms of what y'all have done is somebody who really understands the power and potential of two channel and what you can do. And there's two parts to this is number one, the ability just to do, to do Dirac on your two channel apart from the subs. And then you add to this and my salon twos have three eight inch drivers. These things will go down to 18 Hertz. Okay. And I'm telling you adding four uh, per listens, is just mind-numbingly how tight the base is. And you just can't get that in, in a regular two-channel setup. So kudos to NAD for what you've done. It's one of our favorite demos right now to be do going on and off with Dirac base control. It's just, it's so compelling to hear the difference when you hear all those subs firing in phase and aligned together. It's, it's very cool. So we actually got a cool question that works perfectly on this particular slide. So I'm going to move forward. Jeff, the question here is those feet. And if you all look at the slide, what you'll see is that right below the silver part, it sits on a little a foot there effectively. And the question is, is that just for aesthetics or also for performance? I mean, it's a bit of both. There's aesthetics there for, uh, for sure. They're magnetic. They stick onto the bottom. So they're very easy to move the, the um, unit around but it still has an isolation property to it. The, the silver part that you see there comes to a point. So you're getting a very small contact area and then into a cup. So there is an isolation aspect to it there, but also for aesthetics. And that was introduced with the original master series, the M2. Well, the magnets were brilliant because, so I was putting this on the desk where I'm sitting now and I didn't want to scratch the desk. Right. And so you take them out and you're, cause you don't want to be guessing did I get the right spot and you stick them on the bottom, boom, put it down. So Tay, I don't know if you went through that as well, but I was like, oh, it sorry. was stunning. I didn't realize they were magnetic. I put them down and they just snapped right onto the feet. It was fantastic. It's, it's a really great addition. Okay, so uh, one of the things I wanted to mention, this is sort of funny, like I was going back and forth with Jeff when we were doing beta testing on it. You'll see this is a very simple remote and it's got the, you know, your volume up, down and all that kind of stuff. But the honest perspective for me, and it'd be interesting to get Taylor, your perspective, 95% of people are never going to have to pick up this remote. It is so well integrated into this is the in blue OS system, which basically means uh, there's all these devices that you can get from Blue Sound that will all work together as one combined system. And so most people in the industry think about this as it's like a Sono system, but one that audiophiles really love. And the M66 will fit perfectly into it as if it's one of these devices. But Taylor, you played with it a little bit. Were you using remote control mainly, or did you just get the iPhone in your hand and just went to town? Well, I'll tell you two comments. 
for those of you who don't know, and that's probably the majority, my uh, experience with NAD goes back to the 90s when they used to have the uh, elevated remote control two channel preamps. And there's uh, some aesthetics to this remote that I love. It's all metal. It's got a great feel. But Scott, to your point, here's what I did. Plugged everything in, launched Rune, and in a matter of 48 seconds, I had music playing once I had plugged in the XLR connection. Like, it was seamless. It was just great. Yeah, so it, it's pretty gross. One of the questions here is, is the front uh, touch uh, screen touch sensitive? And the answer is yes, it is. And it, so, and actually I thought about doing that, but I didn't want to pull too many slides from this whole thing because I could have showed you, you can control it from the front of the screen. You can control it from an iPhone. You can do it over Connect or Rune. And you, you, you can control from your computer. So basically any potential way or even from the remote. Um, again, I think most people are going to get so into using either Rune or their phone or an iPad. And right. you can literally control. What's fascinating about it, you can control the music. You can select the music. You can change the settings on the device. Everything from an app. So super, super simple. Scott, um, if, I, if I may add some flavor to that. For those of you who are Rune users, you can do everything from the device. So the moment you start playing, it'll power on the device. You're able to select it. You can control volume right through Rune, so you get all the advantages to that. And you can attenuate everything seamlessly because it supports Rune RAT protocol. You can also group it with either other Blue Node systems or other RAT com Rune RAT compliant systems. So you can do multi-zone uh, high-res streaming throughout your entire house. It's brilliantly designed. Yeah. So um, we obviously, we always take the tops off of devices and we look inside and we try to understand um, not just what are the theoretical specs, but what's really in there, how well is it made? And so I want to take this down a little bit different path here. For me personally, I've been waiting for something to come out for my two channel room that had particular DACs that I wanted and had the sub outs. And this has the ESS Sabre ES9038 Pro DAC. And it's, it's like a mouthful. But the upshot is these are like, if not the best DACs that exist you could possibly do, most people in the industry go, that's the ones we want. And so as soon as I saw NAD was using those DACs, I, oh my gosh. And I knew they were going to design it correctly, the integration of it. So, uh, Teo, maybe you talk a little bit about, you know, do you agree these are good DACs? And then we'll turn it over to Jeff. And Jeff, you can talk us a little bit about the design of the inside. So in my opinion, Opinion, these are some of the best DAX that you can buy in any product. So let's remember, Oppo's UDP 205, this was the DAC that they chose as a standard. Anthem's AVM90 flagship pre-pro, this is the DAC that was chosen. So when NAD had a choice as to where to go, you went for the right thing. I found in my experience using the DAC, it's dead quiet, great dynamic range, and what it does in terms of imaging, what it does in terms of image uh, dimensionality, is just uncanny. So any product that features this DAC, I, I really am curious to always sample. And my first impressions with the uh, with the M66 are very favorable already. Awesome, yeah. And as you know too, with DAC chips, much of the performance is how you implement those chips too. So yeah. we're looking at the, as you said, the 9038 Pro chip, which is an eight channel chip. It's in stereo mode, means four of those channels are summed. We get great dynamics out of that. We get great signal to noise ratio out of that but also the power supply that we're using, the signal path that we're using, the high quality op amps and relays where appropriate that are being used. All of these things contribute to the performance beyond just the chip itself. So we really spend a lot of time and attention in the development of those signal paths to get the results that NAD is known for. And Jeff, this is a fully balanced design too. On the analog side, it is, yes. Yeah, from the analog side, and maybe we'll just stick on that point for a second because one of the personalities I like to call this product is it's a true analog piece from start to finish if the user chooses that way. You can enable analog direct in the menu. Oh, Scott's got it up here on the screen here. You can uh, enable analog direct and it stay the signal path stays analog through and through, including we used a balanced um, ladder resistor volume control in the analog section. So, you know, a high quality volume control. It adjusts it in quarter dB increments, very accurate, very low noise. This is a audiophile analog preamp with so many other features on it as well. 
Yeah, that um, you, very seldom do you see something that can go analog all the way through. And obviously, we didn't talk about the beginning, but on the back of it, one of the things you also see is that it has moving magnet and moving coil inputs. So for those of you that are like, hey, I may one day add this, or I may add that, or I want to put a turntable, it it literally just has everything, which is in terms of input capability. Yeah, and they're direct inputs too. They're not switchable. You've got two independent separate phono inputs there for moving magnet, moving coil. And, and um, it'd be interesting to get your perspectives. I would assume that, particularly because you using Dirac in it, I found you know, using digital domain was fabulous. I'm assuming probably most people that would go analog direct probably would be doing it with a phono, with a, a turntable. Yeah, likely. And you have choices. You can keep that in the analog direct mode all the way, or you can have it come through the DSP and apply Dirac and base management, and base control to it. You've got those options. You can flip it on and off. Like it's there for you to choose. One of the questions that came up, guys, is someone said, hey, if I'm sort of new into the whole DAC world, like what's the first like one or two things I really need to think about if I'm trying to pick the right deck? Well, that's a good question. I mean, um, really like the sky's the limit, as you know, with these things, DAX can be as inexpensive, um, you know, in a couple hundred bucks or as expensive as an automobile, like they're all over the map. But what's interesting about the M66 is it's just all in one. You get streaming a preamp and a DAC, like you just cover so many bases in a premium product here. Yeah. I'll, I'll add to what Jeff is saying, uh, because I look at the DAC and the audio selection first before I look at anything else in, in a product. And what's appealing to me about a product like the M66 is the DAC is a flagship DAC. Secondly, the way that the implementation has been done, surrounded by the high quality audio circuitry, gives you all the benefits that you may lose if you start going with an external DAC. And this is very important, in particular, if you plan to use room correction and Dirac, what people don't realize is they've got the DAC, they're then converting to analog, feeding it into something, then they're doing another conversion. You don't have to deal with that with the M66. It's all there, the signal path is clean, and you're dealing with it in a, as an engineered product end to end. Yeah, and I think, um, so if I sort of mapped a couple of things I would tell someone if they walked into an audio by store or talked to our uh, online team or chatting in, things I might say is, one, let's just look at what the DAC chipset is. We'll start there. And this has the best of the best. Mm -hmm. Then I might look at, well, how well is it implemented? And honestly, the only way you're going to know that is you're going to hear from Teo and his team at Audioholics or from us or people that are experts, or you're going to know this is a brand that has a reputation for implementing really well. Um, then, and I think this is an important point I'd like to just pause on for a second. And I mentioned it, but I think it just, it gets overlooked a lot. You can get a DAC that's not a streamer and you can put it in your system and then you get a separate streamer. When you do that, the downside for most people is that you start navigating, you know, Tidal or you're navigating Cobus or whatever else. And then you want to either change inputs or you want to change the volume. You now put, you, you've got to put that down for most people. You then pick up a remote. You have to be line of sight from the remote to your system and you start changing stuff around. Now for people that have been, you know, maybe listening to turntables and haven't, or maybe you've not been in your system for years, that was the old way of doing it. And so you may be like, oh, that, that's no big deal. But once you get used to having in your hand, the ability to go, okay, this is a little bit softer piece. I'm going to turn this thing up a little bit, or I want to turn it down or and control everything from one device that causes you to think about getting a combined streamer DAC and with preamp capabilities, which is what, you know, why I went crazy over this thing and said, I want to be the one to test it myself when we were fighting about it at audio advice. So anyways, it's, uh, th those are things I would uh, obviously think about. So we actually had a question on this. So I'm glad I, I took a, a copy of this. Um, Jeff, you guys have sort of pioneered this concept of dynamic digital headroom. And you and I went back and forth on it a few times. I'm like, I want to listen to a track and hear it. So can you just explain to people what is what is it all about? Yeah, this is our first piece to offer this technology from NAD. It's a relatively simple solution to a problem that's existed in digital music. And that is when the recording's too hot, you can get distortion in between the sample rates. So this is most commonly found on lower sample rate recordings higher sample rates were kind of into more of the academics of the of the issue versus hearing the issue but what dynamic digital headroom does 
is we basically lower the signal by 3 dB, give some headroom for this clipping to be smoothed out in its its digital analog conversion, and then we add the 3 dB back in on the on the output so that the volume is the same. So it's just a very simple solution of creating more headroom really for those recordings. And those recordings are things where you hear um, fast, high frequencies, and it just will occur in a little bit of shimmer or a little bit of distortion and dynamic digital headroom will smooth that out. And you have the option of enabling that or disabling that in the Blue OS menu. So Jeff, this might be a perfect place. One of the questions here was, does the DAC have oversampling options? This is um, different than oversampling. So it's a, it's a better way of doing what oversampling was trying to achieve. So, um, and again, you can turn it on or off in the system. So if, you, if you're using a lot of low sample rate uh, music, throw it on. And if you use a lot of high res music, you may prefer to just turn it off. Either way, you've got the option. So there was another question in here that essentially said, since the MCC6 has the ability to stream with additional Blue OS components for multi-zones, I'm curious if the M66 uh, with the built-in Dirac will calibrate not only the primary room, but additional rooms too. And no, the answer is on the M66, it's the output out of its unit only. So Dirac is for that particular unit. It's not going to be shared with other units in the ecosystem. Those units would have to have, and we do have units that have that, they would have to have their own Dirac calibration on board. Yeah, and what is true is through the Blue OS app, you can basically, you can set up the M66 as, as exactly as it needs to be, but also each of the other components based on their own capabilities. And their own rooms, their own, yeah, their own room calibration, their own configurations. Yeah. Um, so I thought this might be interesting to point out because I, you know, obviously had subs in my room that I ran without, um, without connecting to the M66. And I did all the things that we show you in our videos of where do you place your speakers and how do you phase align them and everything else. But you can see here in my own room, I had this huge peak between 70 and 80 Hertz. And it's just there. And the fact is the vast majority of people who've never tested their room, you probably are hearing a lot of bass in your room thinking, oh, I've got this great bass. What's likely happening is you're hearing a peak that is overshadowing everything around it. You then stick in, in this case, you run, running the M66 with Dirac on it, all of a sudden that peak goes away and you go, oh my gosh, and all these other frequencies in the base in our arena just come alive that you didn't realize existed. So I don't know, Teo, if you experienced the same thing where you're plugging yours in, but it's pretty, uh, it's almost indescribable when you can use technology to correct the room like that. I, I agree. I, there's a couple of things is for those of you who are into two channel and you're hesitant about uh, subs is a dirty word. I'm running probably the longest tenured speaker with the Salon 2 on Stereophiles Class A list. You cannot tell at all where the Salons begin and end and the ProListens kick in. And the, uh, what's the, the visceral impact, cleanliness of the bass that I'm getting with Dirac, with the NAD, plus with the salons and the prolicens is just pure magic. The salons, as great as they are, just do not have the capability to pressurize my room to the extent that a high quality sub is. So it's seamless, great for two channel and a perfect solution. So this is a really revolutionary product and, and kudos to you all at NAD for architecting it according to the way the science says. Yeah, I'm just going to kind of note here too, like with the licensing that's required to get this type of technology into a product like the M66, like we're looking at $850 currently in US dollars for direct licensing, we include it in the M66. So there's a tremendous amount of value built into our product right out of the box. So um, one of the things I want to pause here, that is just fun to talk about. And um, I'll, I'll get into later. We made a uh, Dirac setup video that helps people go through the process of doing it correctly. But one of the things I point out in the video is this. Most of the time when people run um, calibration systems like Dirac, after they're done, the historic complaint was always my base went away. And usually what was happening was you had exactly what I just showed in the prior slide, which is you can imagine all this extra base because of the room was making me feel, I could feel that 70 to 80 hertz hitting me, even though I wasn't hearing the right thing. 
Then what happens is you go fix it and it becomes essentially flat and, and the room gets improved dramatically. And you go, oh my gosh, it went away. But what really happened is that peak came down. Typically what will happen then is your total SPL in your listening spot has actually dropped by three or four dB because it's cut the peaks off. Because that's cut the peaks off and it's dropped down, what you really need to do is turn your volume level up. So maybe you were running at you know, negative 50 now, and maybe you need to be up two or three dB to be at the actual same volume level. And then you'll go, oh no, it didn't change at all. Like this was done right. Uh, and then obviously for people that like more bass, because a lot of times what happens is because you're getting those peaks, you may enjoy more bass. Your ability to go into deer rack and just say, I want to pull this up a little bit, tweak this. And it does it in a way that is clean and not just one frequency. So I, it really can't be overstated how valuable that is when it's done correctly. Agreed. So uh, one of the questions here, Jeff, someone came in and said, um, how does Dirac affect the analog input? So you talked about it a little bit before, but maybe you can just address that. Directly. Uh, so if the analog direct mode is on, there will be no Dirac room calibration available. It's going right through um, the preamp, staying in analog. You need the DSP. You need the digital to uh, the analog to digital conversion to happen in order to process for di direct to process it. So it's a choice again. So if you want Dirac on an analog source, analog direct has to be turned off and you can then come in and calibrate your analog source just like any other source that's on the M66. It doesn't really differentiate at that point, but it is um, a key point here that if you're in analog direct mode, then no Dirac, obviously, because we're trying to keep the, the signal analog direct all the way through. So there was a question where someone asked about my particular peak and what they were trying to understand is, is that coming from a phasing issue or resonance issue? Um, and th those peaks can be you know, created by a number of things when you have uh, experts in analyzing your room and calibrating your room. But in short, in most rooms, it's the peak in the room based on where you're sitting. And so oftentimes what you'll see is there's a peak there or just the dimensions of the room. For instance, if you had a 10 foot by 10 foot by 10 foot room, you're going to have a real issue because it's just going to constantly repeat that and you're going to see this huge peak. Um, so that's usually where it comes from. And if you've moved all of your uh, subwoofers and gotten them phase aligned, and it's still there, you've got a room issue. So hopefully that answers that a little bit. But but Dirac is magical in what it will do with these things. Scott, it is. I mean, no, sorry, go ahead. That's okay. the advantage of multi-sub too. So if, if you want, I can bring up my Dirac calibration in a sec. And what you start to see is you see the peaks and dips get moved to different frequencies when you're using multi-sub. And therefore what you're able to do through Dirac is you're able to take uh, what might be a null in one area, compensate that with another sub. So the end result is you get an incredibly linear response that's just visceral without all these uh, suck outs because of the room modes. Yeah, yeah. And I'll just mirror that too. Like adding more subs doesn't necessarily make more bass or more SPL. It just cleans it up. It fills in these, these, no, these nodes and voids. But Dirac now has gotten so easy to use that you can see the results right on the screen and you can calibrate it. You can design filters, even very simple, simple filters with Dirac and see what your results should look like. So it's got an incredibly powerful tool now to, uh, to see where your room's going to end up. Jeff, you mentioned this before, but I want to highlight it while we're on this screen. If you look up in the top right, you'll see it has Dirac Live, which for a lot of devices, you go pay extra money to get that license. And then it's got base management and then it's got base control, base control being the very best you can get. And it's multi-sub base control. Multi-sub, yeah. Can you just give everyone just a high level? Why would you want base control, multi-sub versus direct live? Yeah, there's a couple different steps there. So um, direct live really addresses um, the room, um, the main frequencies of the room. Um, there's a couple different levels of direct licenses there. There's one that actually cuts it off at 500 Hertz. And then there's a full version, which gives you full frequency bandwidth. We include the full version, of course, in this product. Um, but when you jump into the base control aspects of it, it just, it uses AI is what the, the, the big breakthrough here with Dirac is that they're using AI to help predict 
and design the filter outputs. And that's where the, pro the software has gotten so much po more powerful than it was with just the more simple direct live. And I, I don't even want to use the word simple because it was very complex and um, advanced at that time. It's just the base control brings a whole new level by adding uh, um, control to not only one sub, but four independent subs. So there's a, there's a couple of things uh, that are really cool when I played with it, that just going into the direct side of it, when you go to base control, instead of you setting the crossover. So imagine when you're setting this thing up, Taylor was telling you earlier, Hey, he got in and got this thing up and running in no time. And one of the things he did was he, and again, I, I show this in the setup in the setup video, but he set the crossover himself. He just went into the setup and told it probably 80 Hertz or whatever you may have done lower because of yourself. But when you go to base control, it actually analyzes and sets the initial crossover itself. So it would, for instance, set it at 70 hertz you can then play with it and try different things yourself if you want to the other thing base control does a really good job of is it moves to phase aligning the subs with the mains and getting those things phase aligned correctly is extremely complex and you'll see it when you hit calculate if if you you'll watch it go through the math and i have a very very fast computer and just watching it but it, the output obviously is quite impressive yeah, one of the questions I get a lot on this too is when you set up your sub in Blue OS, there's a crossover point that is set there. When Direct does its calibration, it doesn't look at that crossover point. So what you set it in that, whether so if you're questioning, do I need to be at 80 hertz or 100 hertz or 60 hertz, it actually doesn't matter. Plug it in whatever because Direct will do its sweep and come up with its optimal crossover point. And as Scott and I have discussed too, which is currently got a lower threshold of 70 hertz, but it will predict the crossover point. It doesn't matter what you set in the Blue OS system the first time around. So uh, going back here, I wanted to show something sort of interesting here. When you run Dirac Live or you run base control, you essentially take the filters that come out and you export them to the device. So now it's in the device and they'll use those filters. But what's super cool about this is it gives you up to five filters. So you can see the chair that I'm sitting in now is my work chair. So I'm sitting in my office. And so you'll see the second filter down says work chair. That had the microphone in this chair sitting at this position where my ears are when it was calibrated. This is not the optimal position in the room I'm in to listen to my two channel system. It's actually in front of me at a two channel seat. So you'll see I have a listening chair there. And then I also have electronic blinds in this room. I can open it close. So you'll see I put a third one in where when you change something in the room, so I could be sitting here and have the blinds open and I re-ran it. And so I can click any one of these right from the app based on where I'm sitting. And it is now calibrated for the seat I'm sitting in. And Taylor, I don't know if you've, if you've even played with that part yet or not. but No, it, it's great. So I want to highlight something that you said and really emphasize it you have the ability to do uh, base control natively within the Blue OS app. Dirac then gives you all that on steroids. So I don't know if you can bring up my, I, I actually just launched Dirac and you're watching my first calibration. If you can just bring that screen share up. So you're seeing right now a quad calibration of subs. And to the point that we were talking about earlier, you'll notice that you have some uh, pretty nasty dips but then those are compensated by the other subs that don't have dips in that area. So I'm getting an end result that's a very, very linear um, output from that. And then as Scott mentioned, what I'm able to do here is I can set different crossovers. So with my Salon 2s, I did one calibration and I have a 70 Hertz crossover. Well, just from the app, I can instantaneously choose a different Dirac curve that I've set. And now I have my Salon 2s crossed at 40 Hertz. And just with the click of a button, you can instantaneously implement different curves or different settings or even different measurements that you've done. So, hey, I have a group of people. It's just me in the listening chair. This thing gives you flexibility. You just cannot get through a traditional analog preamp. And the end result is you can tailor the sound for the best possible performance. And you can't do this with other preamps. So one of the one of the questions here, which fits perfectly on this, either one of you all can take this. Is it possible to toggle between deer rack or base management settings to allow for a low base setting for listening at night? 
So absolutely, yep. You can set whatever filters you want. You've got up to five slots to save them. You could have one that's got a bit of a boosted bottom end for, for nighttime listening and just toggle between the filters in the Blue Oss app. Uh, then there's another question that says, can Dirac potentially help reduce room treatment costs or even eliminate the need for room treatment? Bit of a loaded question, right? Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. It makes improvements, right? And I know that Dirac's got technologies that can take that even further. So there, there's improvements there. Room treatments also help. So I guess it yeah. all depends on the room, doesn't it? My perspective on that is a, a lousy room is going to be a lousy calibration. And, and the one thing that's my perspective is room calibration solutions like a Dirac are going to make a good sounding room spectacular. If you have poor speaker placement, you think that the room corrections everything, you're asking it to do something it's not intended to do. So is it a replacement for room correction? No, it's not. It, it, I think Dirac and all these other systems want you to have a, a decent sounding room. I have windows on one side, so I can't treat those, but it addresses those things in the time domain, the way that it does uh, it, its calculation it reduces the necessity for having an ugly two channel room. Is that a safe way to say it? Yeah. So, you know, I'll add on to that, which is that um, we're in the business of trying to find perfection in audio and you'll never find perfection, right? You'll, 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 you'll strive to attain it and you'll always want to get, get better. And that's part of the fun of the hobby that we all enjoy. Um, generically, we tell people when they come in, what should I do? What about the room? We'll tell them, look, the first thing you want to do is choose a room that has reasonable dimensions if you can. The vast majority of people don't have a choice. Right. They got a room they can put in. That's what they're going to put it in. And then, so the next thing you're going to do is find the best placement for your speakers, right? If you can get them, and this is really what Teo was saying, if you can get the speakers in the right location in your room, you're starting from the best spot. Then if you can treat the room to eliminate some things that are really bad about the room, you should. The vast majority of people can't do that. But you, like you can see behind me, I have bookshelves filled with books. That is a great treatment. So you don't have to go make a room look terrible and put you know, a bunch of stuff that um, is going to look bad. You can do very functional things. And, and we've got videos on it. I'm sure Audio Holics does as well on the types of things you can do. Um, but for the vast majority of people, they are, they've got a room, that's gonna be their room. What something like the M66 with Dirac can do will shock you. And it will take it way beyond what you thought. And you know, it, it, it's obviously a lot of fun. Right. Um, okay, so here I'm just pointing out, um, you can turn this thing on quickly, but you can also tweak this thing to be like hot rotted. And, I did a full video on it, which we do send out to every customer. And I just show you some of our tips, but I'm going to give what I, what I put this up here because I want to remind myself of one tip I want to give you on this device. And anytime you go set up like a DAC streamer preamp, because um, it's a hot part of the market right now, the first thing you should do is go set a volume max in your system. And I put that in all of my tips and tricks videos on things like this. And the reason is if someone goes and sits on a dog, steps on your volume and, and turns it all the way up, or if you didn't really understand it, I had this set up as a preamp or a full audio out, Just you just go straight in, boom. And that's the very first thing you do. And you'll see it in our setup videos. And then uh, some other sort of tips and tricks that you can do from there. And then on, we talked a lot about Dirac and there's some questions in here. So um, I'll just mention here. There's a handful of Dirac setup guides out there. I think a lot of them are good. Some are better than others. We had, if you go to do Dirac, and let's just say you're doing this device or any device, usually the first one that comes up is this one we did. That's got like 100,000 views, but that's three years old. Don't go to that one, which is the bottom one. Go to the one above it that you see we just put out a few weeks ago. That's almost 9,000 you know, 9, views now. That has everything new that was actually done using the m66 and so it has all the newest capabilities and all those types of things and so there, there are a couple of questions that came in on that i think we've covered most of them um okay before we go on to that let's let's go back guys for a second we're going to pop out and let's just start nailing some of the questions as they're popping in here um there was a question in here jeff that said if i'm going to get the m66 
what do I need to be looking for or thinking for in an amp? That's an easy question for my end. It's the M23s, right? It's the matching amp. It's the latest amplifier technology from NAD. They match the aesthetics. They are beautiful amplifiers. So that would be my recommendation, whether it's one or in the future two, you can bridge them. You've got options to, to build a beautiful system. If I may, uh, that's not just marketing speak. Uh, Gene Dallas Allen put them on the bench. They're some of the best measuring amps he, he's ever done in 25 years of measuring amps and audioholics independently. So it's the real deal. So I'm going to just start popping through questions. So feel free to keep popping them in. The questions, you know, we're, we're going to answer as many as we can because there's hundreds coming in here. And uh, obviously we've got a great Blue Sound node for best question. Okay, so um, the question here said, so you have to tune it to two different listening places at once, or is it like a preset option to change whenever I switch seats? So you can build filters based on your measurements. Uh, you can have multiple filters on the same measurement or multiple filters on different measurements. So if you had two different listening areas, as Scott has in his office there, you can design, you can measure those and design filters specifically for those. You would toggle it with a preset though within the app. Right. Yeah, and it's super easy. Uh, in, that, in fact, you can do it both in the app and you can do it in Direct where you toggle back and forth and then listen and it allows you to A-B test and go, oh, I like this one better or whatever else. So, so another question, is Direct helpful in a near field listening environment or is it really designed for a far field environment? I think the same answer applies really. If you measure within your near field environment, you'll have the advantage of the Dirac calibration. So why not? Um, it's there for you to use. Um, so does the RS-232 connection in the back enable one to attach a laptop to manage Dirac settings? Uh, so that's a yes and no um, answer. Um, with a laptop, you're on the network. You can manage direct just over the network, so you wouldn't need to. However, through the RS-232, it is a control point for us. We don't have direct direct software access, but through third-party control systems, the codes are there. So it's just a matter of, of um, implementing the code. So it's, it's more of a third-party control system question, I think, if I'm understanding it right there, than direct itself. Scott, can I add to that? I, I've seen on forums that some folks think you have to plug the microphone and you have to plug into the NAD M66. And that's not the case at all. You do it from your laptop. And the benefit of the way that Dirac has been implemented here is you get the power of your computer, Mac or PC, to do all the processing. So there's nothing you need to plug into. All you do is do an RJ45, plug the NAD into your network, boom. Visible from the app, Dirac on your Mac or PC is able to connect to the NAD. It's pure. It's seamless. So another question we got is what DAC chip does it use? Obviously, we talked about earlier that it's using the 9038 Pro. But also, we didn't mention at the time, it also uses I think, the Sabre DAC going the reverse direction, which is also very good. So instead of going digital to analog on the analog to digital side uh, when appropriate, which is pretty cool. Um, then we have a question with Dirac art or just with Dirac live base control. And I think what the question was referring to is the ability to have impact in the room. And, if, and we went through it, but I think the gist is basically this. Currently, no software is going to perfectly fix a room. Uh, Dirac live base control for the vast majority of people as they exist today will perceive that it has dramatically improved their room and the sound will be dramatically better. Um, Dirac is working on art, which is their ability to try to effectively simulate as if you had done acoustically treated your room. And there's, there's lots of people working on that. That's always work in progress. And it's always, you know, at different levels at any given time, but the direct live base control on this is really, really good. Um, let's see, there are more questions coming in. Um, is EQing and correcting subwoofers via DSP, like in the M66, inherently lossy? Would a system of separates with analog passive low pass crossovers be better? Go ahead, you can take it, Teo. I see you're shaking your head. No, <laughs> no, stay out of the analog. Do it in the digital domain. You have so many different advantages. 
uh, because you can do with Dirac, you can do it in the time domain, you can get all the other advantages that Dirac uh, gives you. And believe me, as someone who has done subwoofer integration in the analog domain, I will never go back. The results are stunning, just stunning. So uh, that's the definitive answer there. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so another one here. Um, if I'm using the streamer direct to a separate preamp via optical, will I benefit from better soundstage separation and detail without using the DAC? Well, at that point, you're using someone else's DAC, mm -hmm. right? Someone else's product. So I really can't comment on what that chain may be. But we, of course, as we've mentioned through this video, as we're using flagship products and implemented well, flagship DAC um, and topology there. So um, we believe it's the best way to doing it. Now you wouldn't want to do it. So that that is the magical thing about this is that it's because when, when you separate the DAC out, you now have this problem that I talked about earlier, which is you're controlling your music and picking this and browsing and moving all around. And but you don't have volume control capability, right? So now you're going out to something. Yeah, Mary, I think there's maybe a misnomer too. This is a streamer and a preamp all in one. You do not need anything else. It's all built in and it bypasses a lot of the um, problems, both from a user interface, but also the conversions you have to do when you start having external streamers. You don't need it. It's all built in. So another one, when comparing the M66 with other products, how highly do you rank Dirac and its sub integration, high pass speakers and low pass the subs? In my opinion, very high. Scott, I've got experience like you do. Anthemark, Dirac, and Odyssey Multi QX on the PC. Like this thing's magic. Period. Yeah. Stop. Yeah, it's it's really really good. Um, it, it's you know it's one of these things. If you're near a store, you should go hear it. If you if you if you don't know and it it if it's set up well, it's super super impressive. It you know, the, the really interesting. When I got to audio advice. This has been now almost 20 years ago. There was like a huge debate. And I was saying, guys, team, we need to move into digital, right? We need to enable digital streams. And at that time, remember, there, there was nothing that was CD quality. And, and the die, there, was, there were three diehard camps. The, all the turntable folks were like, you're crazy. You, it needs to be analog. And then there was another camp that was CD, CD, CD. It's heresy that you would stream or anything else. Now the reality is streaming is so good and you can get – uh, in fact, we're about to put out a video on this where we're going to compare all the major streaming services, the bit rates, how you get it to your device, all of those types of things and sort of show you how you do it. But, but just to cut to the chase, um, if you have a good streaming system, it, it's incredible how good it will sound and lever it leverages devices like this. And that's where the world is headed these days. Scott's own wanted the uh, the model, the M23, which I just said. Someone's looking for what was the matching amp to the M66. M23 is correct, yep. Yeah. Um, okay. Okay, so it says, a bit of a weird question, but will this work with eARC? Absolutely. Yes, it does. One caveat, you have to set it to PCM out, otherwise you're going to get noise and make sure the volume's down and you blow your speakers out. So, yes. It'll work just fine. It's working on my Sony 77-inch uh, OLED with no issues. Let's pause on that because I think a lot of what we try to do in these live streams is, you know, not just give away product, but sort of educate people as well. Explain to everyone why they need to set it to PCM. Okay. Very, very important, uh, everybody. So mark, mark this. Uh, you have different output capabilities from any television. And usually when you have a multi-channel uh, pre-pro for home theater, it's able to decode uh, multiple streams. Well, with this particular uh, product as a two-channel, if you try to feed it a multi-channel like a Dolby or a DTS, it doesn't know what to do with that signal. It just doesn't have it. So what you need to make sure is you convert within the television uh, that stream to PCM so that it outputs it properly and that way it can be decoded uh, within the NAD. So once you do that, you get music. You don't, you get digital noise. So Jeff, I don't know if you want to add, hopefully I explain that in simple enough terms and correct. Yeah, absolutely. I'll just add that that's, and so it's not the same across all NAD products. There are products that will take a multi-channel signal coming in it through its HDMI. 
Um, the M66, the chip that was chosen was a higher performance chip for a flagship product. And that feature was opted out in, to, in favor of the higher performance. So it's not always true, but in the PCM, by changing the PCM, you definitely get more reliability uh, because not all products will do it. It's the most reliable way of doing it for sure. And the only way to do it in the M66. So this is probably a bit of a related question. Does it feature speech enhancement options? I have a hard time with other products when listening to speech media. It never quite sounds as good as playing TV speakers for dialogue. I have my own opinion on this, but I do too. Yeah, I mean, we don't have a speech enhancement feature on the M66. One could argue that through Dirac, you could manipulate some of the some of the frequencies that you want to boost in your room. However, there's no specific feature that enables speech enhancement. Yeah, so this is this really interesting topic. Um, what's happening on your television, and by the way, I have a Peloton as well. Peloton does the same thing. Because they know the most important thing is that you need to hear the speech, you're, you're basically losing everything else. So everything else is being cut out, and what they're putting into the speakers is, like a television, is very cheap speakers to just make sure you can hear what people are saying. But you're losing the gestalt of everything else, and that also happens in a, in a Peloton. Um, because you can calibrate this thing with Dirac, you will find that the speech is way clearer. And um, not only is it clear, but as an example, in my own room, and I have a decent listening room. I mean, it, you know, the way it's shaped, but it's not perfect. My sound is always just barely to the left of center. And as soon as I did the Dirac calibration, boom, locked it right into center, which was, you know, terrific. Um, so another question here. With my current setup, different sources play back at different volumes. Can the M66 balance the different input levels? The answer is yes. We have some gain settings on the analog inputs, if that's the input we're talking about, which is typically the ones that have the, the balance issue, or sorry, the gain issues on there, or the volume issues. So yeah, the answer is yes on analog sources. Okay. I'm going to start throwing a few out. Can I buy amp using the M66? Absolutely. Yeah, which... Uh, we both have that set up behind us right yeah, now. I'm doing that right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, how about this one? I have a Class A integrated amp. Can I turn off the preamp on this and use it as a component? So I think we're talking about the fixed output feature, or, um, which is one that is yet to be implemented in the M66. As mentioned earlier, it's a priority for us to get that feature out. But uh, So stay tuned on that one, really. All right. So are there enough controls with the M66 that you don't need an additional equalizer? Absolutely. Dirac mm -hmm. takes care of that. Yeah. And so it's, it. it's an equalizer on steroids. Yeah. 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 Um, then MC Phono preamps all have their own sound profiles. Would you describe the M66 Phono input as being tube-like or more solid state? Good question on that one. Um, I might fire that one back to you, Scott, because I think you might have had some some analog experience on the M66 so far with your yeah. own setup. Uh, I think it sounds in between, but closer to solid state. Um, and, you know, um, there was a question also that was sort of similar to this, came up a little bit before, which is, would you match a tube amp with it and how would you think about it? I think that's all uh, complete personal preference. Um, we have people on our team and customers that come into the stores that just believe tubes give them that they, they call it the Cabernet wine feel. It's this full feel and, and they love it. They've heard it for many years and that's what they want. Is it technically more accurate than solid state? No. And then other people will come in and say, I want solid state because I can measure it and it measures better than a typical tube, uh, even though it, it may sound more clinical. So Taylor, what's your, what's your take on that? Well, having had experience with both tubes and solid state, it's absolutely a personal preference. So that's it. Music is for us to enjoy, not what someone else is going to tell you. That's my perspective. Okay. So I'm going to jump us back to the couple slides here. And we are now going to give away the blue sound node. So the best question on this is from Aaron Condor. If you are pretty much unlearned on DAX and we're looking at getting one for a decent system, what would be the top factor quality, which we all talked about earlier? So Aaron, thanks for that. 
reach out to the team. We'll match up to make sure we've got your email with the one that was sent in and everything else. And you will get a new super cool blue sound node, which you'll want to use with the M66, which probably you're not going to win. I'm guessing someone else may win that. But if you win it, we know the thing's rigged. Um, okay. So we're nearing the end of the hour. As you know, we do these every month just to get everyone fired up. We've hit in what's coming next month, other than to tell you it's coming from SVS. It's not been announced. It's going to be brand new. It's going to be cool. Uh, we will actually announce what it is on Tuesday, March 26th, and then the giveaway will be April 25th. But you can start getting into the giveaway now, and it sh should be lots and lots of fun. So uh, let's move on to the really cool giveaway here. So uh, we had an enormous number of people come in and obviously go for the giveaway. Um, I suspect virtually everyone that's been on this thing is now like drooling and going to want to go hear this or order one. But it, it is truly an incredible piece. Uh, Jeff, as we go to close this thing out, I just want to, one, thank you for you guys building such an incredible piece. You and your team worked a long time on it. And one of the things that I was super proud of, you know, I was pushing Jeff, like, let's get this thing out. Let's get it out. And for, for months, for those of you who followed it for a long time, for months, they were holding it back because they really wanted to get some more things in. And I was saying, like, hey, as long as it sounds great and all the major pieces work, we can get it out. And people are now used to adding a software update that'll put home theater bypass through and stuff. But they were really fanatical about let's add this, let's add that. And I just I think you guys did a superb job. So great, great work on it. Thanks, Scott. And thanks for hosting this event, too. And, and happy to be here to support it. You bet. We love it. So drum roll team. The new M66 is going to Ryan McLean from Mount Vernon, Washington. Congrats on your M66. Uh, everyone give give uh, Ryan a big hand. And uh, I'm sure you're going to reach out to our team. We'll match you up to make sure everything matched correctly. And you will be getting a new M66. Thank you, everyone, for watching. Teo, it's always a pleasure jumping on with you. And Jeff, Jeff, I know you've got a, you guys are finishing up, set up for the big show. Yep. You know, we'll let you go finish. Thanks, everyone, for watching. And we'll see you next time.